Hallelujah. This prayer says, uh, of such as I have, stay with me, Eric, give I to thee. For such as I have was given to me. I truly received and I truly give. So in the name of Jesus, stand up and live. Hallelujah. Glory to God. That's my prayer today. I want to acknowledge the presence of God and the spirit of love that is in this house, the incredible, rich, and authentic welcome that I received in the roving room. We have some characters among the clergy. <laughs> but we had a wonderful time getting ready for it this opportunity of worship. I want to speak greetings and appreciation to my friend and sister, the Reverend Dr. Amy Butler, and to the entire family that is Riverside Church. I not only have been here before to be with you in the preaching moment, but for a whole semester when I was teaching at Union, I lived down the street and had a chance to come often to observe the service to community that is Riverside Church. I'm also glad to have been asked to become a part of the advisory council, not only asked by your pastor, but I received the invitation graciously and with joy, because it's important that we work together for intersectional justice in the time in which we live. This is a peculiar time. And it's going to require a peculiar people to do the work that we are called to do. And I'm so glad to be peculiar today. I just love it. <laughs> Another word for that is queer. Queer. Used to be an insult. Now we wear it with joy and gladness. I serve a queer savior who was himself a heresy who was himself problematic. And I say often they did not kill Jesus because they thought he was the son of God. They killed him because he was a political subversive who had the audacity to speak truth to power. How many more queer people in the room? I want to see who you are. Where are the queer people in the room today? God bless you. And so let me share a little bit from my heart to your heart. I'm very glad to be standing in this pulpit on Pride Sunday, and I cannot stand in this pulpit without acknowledging a couple of things. I thank God for Rivers of Living Water. You heard them sing earlier. Rivers of Living Water UCC, right here in New York and in New Jersey. Pastor Vanessa Brown closed her service today to be in this service today so that we could be together. Come on, let's celebrate. Rivers today. I am a native of San Francisco, and some of my friends in the Midwest and on the East Coast suggest that that is my problem. <laughs> I was born in San Francisco and at the Mount Zion Hospital, the Jewish hospital that was in the middle of the African-American community. And not too many years ago, because I am a native of San Francisco, I know a lot about earthquakes, a lot. In fact, when I was a child coming along, we had earthquake preparedness. For people who are from places where there are hurricanes and tornadoes, they have hurricane and tornado preparedness. Earthquake preparedness required you to get under your desk at the sound of a horn or the sound of a siren, and we were supposed to learn how to be safe in an earthquake. 
You get under your desk, they tell you, stand in the doorway. They'll tell you, don't go out in the street because many people perish from parts that fall off buildings. It's just a whole lit litany of things that we learned as children. Not long ago in the mid-80s, we had a significant earthquake that was called the Loma Prieta earthquake. And I was driving down the street in my car, and I felt what felt like I'd run over a bump. My car sort of lifted off the roadbed and then came back down. When I got to the house, when I got to the door, my partner and my children were standing at the door waiting for me. When my key turned, they opened the door, they grabbed me and pulled me in, and then started touching me on my body to see. They said, are you okay? Did you do all right? And I said, what do you mean, am I okay? They said, well, we just had an earthquake. I said, what earthquake? And then it dawned on me that that's what made my car jump off the roadbed when I was on my way home. We were praying, they said, and praying you through the earthquake. We were praying and praying you through the earthquake. I was conscious of earthquakes. And I was also conscious of the fact that in my part of the country, we build our buildings with earthquakes in mind. We do it because terrible things happen when we don't. San Francisco survived an incredible earthquake at the turn of the century, and we've had earthquakes since that time. We live on an active fault that's called the San Andreas Fault. It's deep, it's present, and every few hours of every day, we have an earthquake. We just don't feel them because they're too far down in the earth. But the San Andreas Fault yawns and moves and stretches consistently and constantly because we are upon a living earth. Amen? We build dead buildings on a living earth. Let me keep going. And so in San Francisco, we're conscious of that. And we keep it in mind because we know what happens. And our history tells us, no matter how fabulous and magnificent we build our architecturally world-renowned structures and monuments, they are dead structures on a living earth. And they can be utterly destroyed in seconds by a certain kind of seismic event. Even our monuments have had to respect our movement. Oh, glory to God. I had a Pentecostal moment right there. Even our monuments have to respect our movement. The movement of the earth under us is at constant moving, and our monuments are at constant risk of being destroyed. So our monuments have to be retrofitted. That's what we call it. Let me tell you what retrofitting really is. It is building a building to mimic moving, living things. We try to make a building act like living things act, like palm trees. You know, we have a lot of palm trees in Southern California. Palm trees know what to do in an earthquake. When the earth shakes, the palm trees lay down, and then they come back up. Everybody got that? Let me do it again so you can see it. They lay down, and then they come back up because they have roots and because they are living in a place indigenously, living in a place where earthquakes have existed. They know they have to sway and they have to move with the movement of the earth. If they don't flex, they will crack and break and crumble and fall down. They have to bounce. Come on now. Because bouncing is important. And when we retrofit our buildings in San Francisco, we do incredible things. Some of our buildings, skyscrapers, actually have hydraulics underneath them. So when the earthquake comes, they bounce. We have some buildings that are on huge rollers. So when the earthquake comes, they move from side to side because they are dead things mimicking living things. Built 
on foundations that have to mimic life just so they can survive. And even with everything we do, with the multiple billions of dollars we've spent in San Francisco, some of our buildings still fail because the earth is a mighty living thing. And here's what I want to leave with you, sisters and brothers. Those of us that are of the church and whatever in whichever way we acknowledge, understand, and worship the divine. We must know the difference in being a monument and being a movement. The two are very different. And I'm very concerned at the present time that what I am hearing back from church, and perhaps what I am not hearing back from church, given our present political atmosphere, I'm not sure if the church is entrenching, entrenching itself more as a monument, or is the church, or is religion as we understand it, remembering that we are and ought to be movement-oriented. You see, we need a movement because I think that we might have abdicated our responsibility in this time. We need a movement as people who claim to be in relationship with the divine. Why? Because religious history is filled with monuments. Big, formidable, often miserable institutions, come on now, with immovably entrenched ideologies that divide and separate and separate and divide and diminish and destroy, all in the name of the current socially acceptable God. And I read the other day when I was at the Museum of Natural History and also at the African American Museum when I was in Washington, D.C. How complicit the clergy and the church was in the work of chattel slavery in this country. And once someone said in a quote that it must be of God because the judges are with it, the politicians are with it, and all of the church has supported it. It must be of God because the church has supported it. And I thought about it when I looked in this same display case where this statement was made and there were chains in that case. I want you to see that with me for a moment. The statement was made and the chains were there at the same time. And the frustration that I felt in my spirit is how problematic it is when people who are religious abdicate their responsibility and become more attuned to and connected to the monument than the fresh flowing move of the Spirit of God. Sometimes we can get in the place of monument thinking because monument thinking seems to be politically correct. Amen, Bishop Flunder. <laughs> and also because movement thinking is dangerous. Can I tell you it's dangerous? to be involved in movement thinking when you're moving and government is not with you, when you're moving and religion is not with you, when you're moving and culture is not with you. If Jesus was walking in the flesh here today, he would say, you can get dead doing that stuff. Because movement work is often dangerous. But our history is filled with monuments. Thank God for reformation. Thank God for reformation. Thank God for shakings, reformations that reformed and reinformed. Come on now. Thank God for earthquakes. You see, in San Francisco, when we have a good earthquake, even if there is a good retrofit, what will fall off of the building first will be facades. <laughs> what is a facade? A facade is there for pretty, but it's useless. Sometimes as religious people, we have to stop and ask ourselves, what are we doing for pretty? And we just keep doing it, but it's useless. Anybody hear me? Sometimes it's just useless. Sometimes somebody says, so why do we do that? We say, we don't know. But we've done it for 150 years, and we're just going to keep on doing it. Well, is it helping anybody? Not really. 
Does anybody enjoy it? No, they really don't. But we just keep on doing it because that's the way it was done and we're going to keep doing it because culturally it makes us feel like we are really church. There are some things that are just useless. And it begs the question that I asked when I was a kid coming along when Mother Bertha Robinson was our youth leader. Mother Bertha Robinson was one of those youth leaders that drove one of those wood panel station wagons. Anybody know? Somebody goes back that far with me one of those wood panel station wagons. And we could get in Mother Bertha Robinson's station wagon with our hot dogs and put mustard and relish and stuff all over her car. She didn't care. She was one of those kind of youth leaders. Every fifth Sunday, Mother Bertha Robinson was in the kitchen working to raise money for the youth department. There was one real problem. Mother Bertha Robinson was not a good cook, not at all. She was one of those people that when she cooked fried chicken, it would be burned on the outside and bleeding at the bone. Anybody understand? <laughs> one of those people that when she made a pound cake, it was a little salty and dry, and we couldn't understand what was wrong with it. But she raised money because people would say, oh, Mother Bertha, here's a donation. Keep the dinner. And, <laughs> and she could raise money, Mother Bertha. And it, and it leads me to this concept for 20 years, 22 years or so of my life, Mother Bertha Robinson made a bad cake. It was a terrible cake. And she made it all the time. And it begged the question, what is a 20-year-old bad cake? It's a bad cake. It doesn't get sanctified with time. It was bad from the beginning. The ingredients were inappropriate and wrong. It was dry from the first time she made it, and it stayed dry until Mother Bertha Robinson made her last cake and went into the presence of God. It never got better because it wasn't good from the start. And there are some things that we are sometimes at church that are just not going to get better until we move from monumentizing what we do and move to movementizing what we do. Let me, let me go on. Thank God for change. Some folks thought that a big, fine, old, respected denomination or institution filled with outdated exclusionary clauses in its religious rules would be strong enough to hold back movements and monuments that are in some way in the way of movements. But no matter how big or how finely organized, when a real shaking comes, everything can be shaken down. When a unity shaking comes, when a love shaking comes, when a justice shaking comes, we'll find out sometimes how miserable monuments are. You know, it happens like this. Outside of our church building, we have a stop sign, a three-way corner, and there's one stop sign. We really need three stop signs, it's, but we only have one outside of our building. And I found out, and I said this to the city, you won't do anything until somebody gets hurt or killed at this corner. We're suggesting that we do something now because there's a certain inevitability. But if someone gets hurt or killed on that corner, then there will be a new stop sign. If two people get hurt or killed, then there'll be a stop light. If three people get hurt or killed, then there'll be two stop signs and a stop light. Essentially, something has to happen. And so it is with how we become burdened sometimes as monuments. Essentially, when we begin the work that we begin, maybe our book of order was like two pages long. And then somebody slept with somebody. And then we added a third page. Anybody understand what I'm saying? And then some of the deacons stole some money and we added a fourth page. I'm sure it doesn't happen here. And then a little further down the line, you understand somebody fell down the stairs and then we had a fifth page. And before you know it, what was a pamphlet <laughs> becomes a huge volume. And somebody will say, you can't do that. We say, why can't we do it? Because you go to Article 3, point 2, small a, dash 1, in the addendum. You understand? And you'll see, because before long, what was once a movement has become burdened down, come on now, with legalisms and rules and responsibility. And we're so pressed with holding to the rules that we can't remember the movement. 
the movement, the movement, which means that sometimes people have to be released to be who God has called them to be without all the ridiculous strictures that prohibit us from being a living, breathing organism. Now, I'm preaching now, so let me get on. There has to be a shaking. Why? Because our facades have to fall off. A real shaking that makes our facades fall off because monuments are not built often with the movement in mind. You see, it was movements that freed slaves. It was a movement that got women to vote. Come on now. It was a movement that brought justice to workers in this country. It was a movement that opened the door to equal rights and equal marriage for the same gender-loving community and the trans community. It was a movement. It was a group of people who linked arms and they linked purpose. We laid down in the street in coffins until money and and prescriptions were available for people living with HIV. It took a movement, it took a group of people linking their arms and singing loud in three and four part harmony. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me round. See, that's movement music right there. It's that kind of determination. Now, let me take you to this. Acceptance is good, but there is little or no action in just accepting that things need to change. You can be an accepting person personally and privately. And I'm talking to everyone who feels that you have now retired from the movement and you have taken off your Birkenstocks and you have put your signs in the attic and you're leaving it to someone else. Let me say to you, you can accept that change is necessary personally and privately. But I am saying that this present reality that we are in now is calling everybody back from monument thinking to movement thinking. We need help, and no one is excluded from this movement. Can I say something to you? And here is my confession. My present is now framed with some concepts that I developed in my past about my anticipated future. When, when I was a girl coming along, I did not imagine that I could have a day like this. And let me just say that. I did not imagine that there would be a day possible like this. Not only the negatives, but the positives as well. Let me say it this way. When I was a young Pentecostal female coming up in the Church of God in Christ, and my belly was filled with a desire to be a change maker. I couldn't understand how that could possibly have been possible for me. And all of the things that I sensed myself to be and knew myself to be, female, female clergy, budding clergy, a same gender loving woman, a black woman, and a Pentecostal. Now I want you to think about that. That's a whole lot of sugar for a dime, if you think about it. <laughs> Trying to figure out how I was going to be able to do what I had seen in the Spirit. Does anybody know what I'm saying? It's, I saw it in my dream life, in my prayer life. I saw days like this, times like this, but I couldn't perceive how I could possibly get there. And God gave me a dream. I used to play a, a classical clarinet in the orchestra. And when I played my horn, what I know about a wind instrument is that when it makes an off note, it's a horrible note. It's usually really dissonant and very problematic. And in my dream, I asked the question, how can such a dissonant note be a good thing? And in my dream, the head of the orchestra said to me, only if the conductor changes the key of the song because then your dissonant note will fit where it was once a problem. My testimony is that what I'm living now, I'm living because activist people worked until we saw the whole song change. And the thing that used to be my problem is now my blessing. Oh, you didn't hear what I said. 
The thing that used to be the reason people rejected me has become the reason that people call on me. I said, now this is, this is not what I anticipated. I thought I would always be in a hole or in a closet and never be able, but now in the former administration of the White House, sometimes they would call and they would say, what we need is somebody who is female, get this now, black, gay, come on now, church, and they could send one airline ticket and get all of that when they invited me. <laughs> Isn't that something? Everything that was my oppression became my blessing because movement people got busy and moved and changed such that the whole song had another key. Sisters and brothers, we're going to have to change the key of this song. There's a song being sung out there right now that is a song that does not come from the heart of God. We are going to have to get out there and because our children are depending on us. They need us to change the key of this song. And finally this. On my journey, I've learned some things. Institutions sometimes are placeholders until we can move to the next level of growth. But what happens is sometimes we fail because we are spending too much energy trying to maintain the facades that we've created. We lose the heart of what it is that we're trying to do. We lose the soul of what it is sometimes that we're trying to do because the burden of maintaining the monument is so great. Maintaining the organization, maintaining the denomination, maintaining, just maintaining, until we lose sometimes the heart of why we do it. A preacher came to me and said, Bishop Flunder, I want you to pray for me. He said, 30 years I've been pastoring my church, and 15 of those years I have hated my job. And of course, I was about to speak to him out of my ego and say to him, well, why don't you just leave? when I realized that perhaps he needed to stay because he has children, because he has bills, some of us probably left over seminary bills, because he has a medical insurance policy there, because he has an automobile allowance. I don't know, but for some reason, for 15 years, beyond his joy, beyond his passion, beyond the time of movement, he stayed. So I have a question. How many of us are stuck and we can't get in the movement and we're blaming so many things? It's, I blame it on my marriage. I blame it on my children. I blame it on my job. I blame it. I just, but you're miserable doing what you're doing. I want to encourage you, get back in the movement. Take some more risks. Hey, glory. Do a few more things. Answer a, another dangerous call. Put yourself in harm's way again and get back in the movement because somebody's future depends on what we do today. Institutions and so proactive leadership, the way that we ought to be involved in this is in need of profits. Hallelujah. I said proactive leadership is in need of profits. Now, I fully realize, sisters and brothers, that spirit-filled movement risk is risky. Placing oneself, again, in harm's way, sticking one's neck out, risking professional, familial, and denominational sometimes assassination, taking the heat, having to unfriend some people off Facebook. Come on now. Hallelujah. Take them off your speed dial. Getting in the fray, taking a public position, speaking truth to power, acting up and acting out. But we are not moving from a weak place, for God is still able to do exceeding abundantly above all we could ask or think. And if my foremothers and forefathers didn't decide at some point that they were going to bury their chains and sing the song that before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave 
and go home to my God and be free. If they had not believed that, I wouldn't be able to stay in the hotels where I stay, fly on the planes where I fly, demand justice for housing and for food and for inner city care. I would not be able to demand justice for the immigrants, come on now, that have to come or desire to come to this country. And I had not been set free from this kind of oppression by the people who were made to come to this country and built it. I said to somebody who said the other day, but you know, we want our country back. And I said to them, so now wait a minute. This is my country too. So now wait a minute. I was born here. Well, you know what I'm saying. I said, yes, I do know what you're saying when you say you want your country back. But if you didn't want it to be my country, you should have picked your own cotton. I had a moment. I had a moment. You should have pulled your own tobacco. You should have breastfed your own children. It was a moment. I had a moment. But since I'm here, I want you to know it's also my country. And what we need to do is open up our borders and love people who are oppressed all over the world if we are going to bring peace to the earth. And so take this with you. The movement time is now, now. Somebody said, well, let's wait and see what happens in the elections in 2018. Don't you do it. Movement time is now. There are decisions that are being made about health care this week. Movement time is now. It is now. It has to happen now. Someone said, well, I don't know how to vote. Well, let me just tell you real clearly that the ovens are being heated up. Somebody said, what do you mean? Because I'm talking about a plan that is going to take the lives of people. You see, the way that health care, come on, is being moved is so that frail elderly people will not be able to live. They will die. What will happen is poor people will not be able to live. They will die. People with pre-existing conditions will not be able to live. They will die. And the people that will survive this will be the people that, one, have the money to survive it or have the youth to survive it. Well, since I just became a senior citizen this year, I declare that I am not expendable in that way. I am important to this country. I am important to the people who follow me. I am important to my folks, and I am important to you. You need me, and I need you. None of us are expendable. We are not going to support a health care bill that kills off a group of the nation so Wall Street will do better. That is not what we are going to support. Amen, Bishop Flunder. It's time. It's movement time. Movement time for who? For any historical African-American organization that will refuse to be constipated by a shadow of its former self. I want to see every organization get busy and let's not fall back on the laurels of Martin King's work. Come on now. We need some new Martin Kings. Oh, if I was in a Pentecostal church, I would tell you, ask your neighbor, are you ready? Hallelujah. How about you? Are you ready? It's movement time now to pass the fire to the generation that is coming after us. It is time for the formidable church everywhere to refuse to be private social clubs with gospel music and choreographed Christian entertainment. It's time to move beyond that. We got it down to a fine science. But I want to know, are we allowing ourselves to be in harm's way? It is movement time for all the fraternities and sororities and the Masons and everybody who is out there, the unions. We need to use our influence and our income to positively affect our communities and not to simply move out of our communities into the suburbs. It's movement time. It's movement time for politicians who will not be bought by money. Come on now. Or fame. Or opportunities to be on the news. Who won't forget where they came from and who voted for them. And for people to believe that many of those who we try to impress, many of those who we try to impress are still languishing 
in the places where we left them. Move off the block. Don't forget the block. Come on now. When you move up to the east side, to a deluxe apartment <laughs> in the sky, moving on up, anybody hear what I'm saying? To Riverside. Don't you forget where God brought you from. Don't you forget when your family did not have two dimes to rub together, but God made a way and opened the door. Don't you forget that somebody swept floors and washed clothes and cleaned up so that we could get the educations that we have. Don't forget, don't forget that somebody else needs you now to look back and to help walk them out of the places that you came from. Movement time now. Movement time for educators who won't drink the Kool-Aid. Movement time for educators who won't drink the Kool-Aid and think that public school is still somehow or other problematic. Some of our children, that's the only choice they have. Don't get tricked. Movement time that moves away from suggesting that inner city children of color are developmentally flawed. Oh, I'm on. Something is wrong with that thinking. And we need to move away from, not move away from those children, come on now, but move away from that thinking. If you don't know how to teach black children and Latino children, it's not the children's fault. Move away from that thinking. Come on. Different doesn't mean dysfunctional. Different just means different. It's movement time. And I'm going to Pentecostally sit down. God is about movement, much like living water rivers. Movement. God is about movement. Water doesn't freeze when it's moving. Churches don't freeze when they're moving. Denominations don't freeze when they're moving. Monuments will fall before movements every time. God is not privately owned, and God is not a stagnant pond. God is a fresh-flowing river. God doesn't have a political party. Amen, Bishop Flunder. God is about fresh, liberating truth, and God is about extravagant welcome, and God is big enough to include all of us simultaneously. And to my closeted LGBT folks in the room, closets, especially church closets, are unfit for human growth and habitation. Closets are musty. They have no windows. They are dark. They are created for storage. They're not there for living people. I want to welcome you to the light, and I encourage you to break out, bust out, come out, come out, come out, come out. There's fresh air over here. Come out. We're waiting for you. We've got some good things to share with you. Come on out of there. There's a whole community that will love you. We're in the midst of a love movement. We're in the midst of a justice movement. We're in the midst of a living movement. We're in the midst of a blood movement that will redefine what God is saying. And if folks don't know, they need to know that we are capable and we are talented and we are gifted, hallelujah. And if you don't know, just keep watching us because we are the hope and the dream of the slaves, but we are also the hope and the dream of the transgenders. Come on with me now. That broke out the walls and fussed with the police department and walked off with their hands behind their back right here in this city and started a movement that reverberated all the way to California. We are the hope and the dream of those people who not until a couple of years ago were really acknowledged for what really happened at Stonewall. The blood is waking up. It's movement time. Get upset. Get mad, cuss if you have to. It's now officially legal. I'm giving it to you by Episcopal mandate. Cuss if you have to, but move. It is movement time. God bless you. Look at that.